Hi, this is Miss Linton, and this is just a regular, ordinary AP Bio day. But uh, we are missing a couple of our classmates today who are under the weather, Gosia and Mateen. Can you say hi to them? Hi. All right, so hopefully one of you will tell them that I'm putting this up on the YouTube channel um, so they can watch it. And also you can if it will help you prepare for your labs. Okay, so let me, I'm going to answer your question, but let me just address this picture first, okay? And so, and by the way, this lesson, we are going to review diffusion. We are going to talk about active transport using a membrane, and we are going to talk about investigation four. And I'll try to remember to stop it intermittently when you guys are discussing things. All right, here we go. So why does the salt bother the snails? When you put a salt all in those, and I'm not saying to do that, but to, salt, to snails or slugs, what does it do to the environment around it? Just tell me. Makes it hypertonic. So that means on the other side of the membrane, inside that um, snail or slug, their solutions are hypotonic and water must flow, flow from, from the, the hypo into the hypertonic solution which is salt so they are getting depleted of water and that's what's going to kill them okay now recall there's three ways to cross a cell membrane what is it through the phospholipid bilayer what else channels or carriers we should be on white um, and whole membrane, endo and exocytosis. Perfect. Okay, now you had a question. Yeah, so when you, can diffusion happen when the solute moves from higher to lower? Temperature? Yes. So in this example, would the salt also move into the snail? Yeah, the salt could also go from a higher concentration to a lower, it would probably become an ion. That's a really good point. It would probably become sodium and chloride ions and then that would actually diffuse into its tissues. Okay. Which would also be bad. Yeah. Yeah. All equally bad. All right. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about is when we talked about like a blood cell in a hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic solution, can you just, youngest bio buddy went already, oldest bio buddy, can you just talk about what would happen to a red blood cell in a hyper, hypo, and isotonic solution and why? Go. So if you put a red blood cell in an isotonic solution, the same amount of water would go in and out. But if you put it in a hypertonic solution, then the, the interior of the red blood cell would be hypo and it would go from the water would move, water must flow from a hypo, it would leave the red blood cell, and the red blood cell would shrink. Conversely, if you had a hypotonic solution around that red blood cell, the water would come in and the red blood cell would burst. All right, come back to me. Can the same things that happen to a red blood cell happen to a plant cell? Yes. Where would we draw the line? Where would we say this probably wouldn't happen? What wouldn't happen? It wouldn't burst. And why wouldn't it burst? Because it has a cell wall. And that cell wall will push back. Okay? Remember when you learned about the forces Newton last year? Remember? Yeah, equal and opposite forces. All right. Now, let's apply this to the water potential equation. Okay? So the water potential equation, the reason why you use this with plants is because you have to add in the effects of the cell wall. And the part that does that right there is right here. Okay, that's the pressure potential. That's what the P stands for is pressure. And this is pressure exerted by cell wall. And there are times when it's gonna be negative, but you could you pretty much think of this as a positive value. When it's pushing back, it'll be a positive pressure, okay? To push water out of the cell. Okay, there are exceptions to that. The S right here stands for solute potential. Sure. Solute potential is referring to the OASs, or osmotically active substances, things that are going to interact with that water. Okay? And you need to remember that water potential at its highest, the highest possible value you can have for water potential, do you know what that number is? Zero. That's the highest possible water potential value you can have. The best, purest water with nothing dissolved in it will be a water potential of zero. Okay, I'm going to flesh that out a little bit more. On OASs, that stands for osmotically active substances, I want you to think about the lab that you did where you had your beaker 
you recall, um, and you filled it with distilled water, and then you had little bags, dialysis tubing, and inside you put glucose, yes? Okay, now, if you had also sprinkled some glucose into the beaker, would that have affected how much the water moved? Yeah, right? Because this right here, its water potential is actually zero because there was nothing in there, okay? This water potential here was a negative value because it had what inside of there? Yeah, it had some glucose in there, okay? Now, we just call, when we say hyper hypotonic, that's because if you had a membrane, any membrane involved that you can use hyper hypo left right up down hyper hypo but if we took this dialysis tubing out of here this beaker right here would still have water potential equal to zero because there's no pressure on it it's just atmospheric pressure because water potential is equal to sorry sorry water potential is equal to pressure potential plus solute potential is there anything in there no. So if you want to talk about a measurement and it's in bars, B-A-R-S, lowercase b, then if you want to talk about it as a measurement of what kind of potential it has innately, you would say it's zero. As soon as I start putting things in here, the pressure is probably still zero because it's sitting here at atmospheric conditions, but this number is going to go what? Yeah, it's going to go negative, which will mean overall your water potential is a negative value. Anytime you add something in there, it gets negative. Okay, so this was full of glucose, so it's negative. Does that make sense? But we don't deal with the cell wall there, you know, in, you know, in this kind of situation, it's usually applied to plants. However, in your lab though, if you didn't leave room in your dialysis tubing <coughs> for it to expand, what could the dialysis tubing have done? Push back so you don't gain the right amount of weight. Ah, that may help you with your air, okay? Because it would not have gained the right amount of weight because all of a sudden it would be acting like a plant cell. We didn't set this scenario up to act like a plant cell. Okay, that's why you had to leave room in that solution. Okay, now knowing that, let's apply it to this situation right here. So here is a beaker of pure distilled water, okay? There's, it's at atmospheric pressure, so there's no, nothing pushing back on it anywhere. We're not in a vacuum. We're not going down in a submarine. We're not flying up in the air, okay? So pressure is zero. Our solute uh, potential is zero because why? Nothing, nothing in there. So our water potential, which is a factor of pressure potential plus solute potential added together, is zero, okay? Now, let's look at this. Here is a plant cell. Now, if I were to take this plant cell and put it in here, okay? It's a really big plant cell, okay? Initially, if you look here, pressure is zero because it wasn't interacting with any kind of water coming in or out of it at that point, okay? But you know that there is stuff in here because it's a plant cell. Name some things that would be in there. Chloroplast, sure, big organelles. Could there be enzymes in there? Could there be manufactured sugars in there? Sure, all kinds of stuff in there. So it's solute, things that interact with it would be negative two. I can tell you how to calculate that in just a minute. Just right now, for all you need to know is, and it's negative two, and just live with that, okay? So overall, when I add those together, it is negative two. But over time, if you put this in here, and this is negative two, and this is zero, water must flow from the hypo, okay? So water's gonna, water is gonna flow into here, but eventually, water is going to keep flowing in, and the wall maybe is going to push back. Okay, I'm still recording. The wall is going to maybe push back at 0.5. Then it's pushing back at 1. Now it's pushing back at 1.5. And eventually, it's pushing back at 2. So the wall is saying, get out water with a positive force of plus 2. And inside, the contents of the cell is saying, come in water with a force of what? Negative. Negative two plus two minus two, zero. At this point, the water potential outside the cell is equal to the water potential inside the cell, so there will be no more what? No change, yes. 
no change. No change at all because the wall is pushing back. Are we okay with that part? Okay, so are the solutions here and here inside the cell and surrounding the cell, are they isotonic? No, they are not isotonic. There is more stuff in here, osmotically active substances inside the cell than outside the cell. But the reason there is no net change is because the wall is pushing back. Now, I, let's back it up. I could have put in this, this initially, let's say start all over again, and I put the cell in here, okay? But I could have put it in a solution that was isotonic, that had stuff in it, to the tune of minus two, and the solution would have started out at minus two, and this one would have started out at minus two, and that's another way to get no net change. You see that? Two different ways. One would have to take some time, because over time, water would be coming in and the wall would be pushing back. That's one way to get the change to be the same, right? So you're minus two, you're zero and zero on either side due to the wall pushing back. Another way is if I had put stuff in this solution to begin with, so it was already at negative two, that also would have created no net change. Okay, not it. Not it. Whoever's not it, pass or play, this is on you. Go for it. <laughs> So hopefully you're reviewing this. Okay, come back to me. Any questions you want to ask me so far? Questions you want to ask me so far? Okay, yes. So does the water potential directly correlate to the change? Because you said that um, if the, the solution was isotonic, then the water potential for distilled water would be negative two. Okay, n no, not for distilled water. If, if I would have changed it, if I have stuff out here, it's no longer distilled water, pure distilled water. It's, it's some sort of molarity of a solution. So I'm just telling you, one way to cause no net change is to make sure you had enough solutes out here that it would be equivalent and be isotonic with the plant cell. That would have been no net change. This kind of net change takes place over time because water keeps coming in and the wall's pushing back in order to bring this to the water potential of zero, which is the equivalent of this originally, the, wa the water potential was zero, okay? All right, now, those are big ticket items. Let's go back here. Um, when we say that we are, nothing's changed, okay? But this is how you can use it in the lab and in your lab, and I'll give you a chance to practice with this. Go ahead and get a calculator out right now because you'll need it for your quiz today, and you'll need it for our practice right now. Should you always have a five-functioning computer or computer calculator in here? Yes. You should never say, oh, I don't have it today. It should be in here every day. You need a calculator in math every day. You need a calculator in here every day, okay? And you literally can do everything you need to do in this class with a dollar store calculator, okay? Literally a dollar store calculator. We'll have all the functions you need. All right, now. When you can get the pressure to be zero, okay? Like, for instance, when I just showed you right there, those potato cells, if we had made a solution around it that was equal and equivalent to the same water potential, minus two, right? If I could have created some solution like that, then they wouldn't gain and they wouldn't, what? Lose, because they are not, it's not hyper-hypo, it's what? Isotonic. Now, some of your potatoes, did they gain weight? And some of your potatoes, they <coughs> lost weight, okay? So let's talk about 0.0, .0 molar solution. So that's pure distilled water, right? Yeah. Okay, pure distilled water, and you dropped your potatoes in there. Pure distilled water, that would be high 
bow tonic. Your potatoes would be high per tonic. Water must flow from the hypo. You would expect it to flow into your potatoes. You would expect the percent change in mass to go up. Conversely, take those potatoes and put them in one molar. You know I gave you a super sugary solution at one molar. It's like syrup. So you put them in there, the solution around your potatoes would be what? Hyper, and your potatoes then are hypo, water must flow from the hypo out of your potatoes. Their percent change mass would be a negative. If I could have known the water potential of those potatoes, I could have made a solution that was what to the potatoes? Isotonic, where they would neither gain nor lose. Can you buy that? At that point, if I could have made that solution, if I could have known and I worked up that solution, at that point, would the wall be pushing back? No, because the solutions on either side of the potato cell membrane would be what? Isotonic. So the wall would not push back. At that point, your pressure potential is eliminated. Therefore, my water potential would just be equal to my solute potential. Because I've wiped out pressure because anything plus zero is that anything, right? So that's easy, that part's easy. Now I need to know what is solute potential equal to. So if I know that, then I know the water potential of those potatoes. Well, guess what? There's an equation for that. It's negative ICRT. That's the equation. Now, pre-2013, all my students had to memorize these equations, okay? Now you get an equation sheet that you get to use, you know, to, so you don't have to memorize any of that. But I want you to understand it well enough that if faced with a problem like that, I want you to be like all my students in the past, they're like, I didn't even, lose, didn't even use it. I didn't even use it because I understood it, okay? So be there, take a big breath in, let it out. Comprehension time. Now, let's break it down, what each of these things are. The negative is negative because we know anytime we add anything to water, it's not going to be zero, it's going to go negative. So that is always going to be the same, negative. Okay. The I, that refers to an ionization constant. And in fact, I need to, I'm going to scoot this over just a little bit. Hang on one minute. minute. Oh, okay. You stay there. Okay, so um, negative is going to be negative. The I is what's referred to as the ionization constant. Glucose put in water does not form any ions, so the ionization constant is 1. If instead of glucose in this lab, we'd used uh, sodium chloride, Na, and Cl, then the ionization constant would have been 2. What if we used glucose and sodium chloride, it would have been three. Now I have never seen them ever do anything other than one. So a lot of times people just go one, you know, and they don't think anything about it, but you need to include it if you're showing calculations. So you need to understand why it's there. So you would put a one this time because we used, let's say we're using a glucose solution, okay? I, don't, I wouldn't stress out about that, but if they were like being tricky on a problem one time and they said, in a diffusion lab where you use sodium chloride, which would form two ions in water, then you'd go ding, 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 ionization constant of two. Okay, good. The C has to do with the molarity of whatever solution you're talking about, whether it's a 0.2 molarity or a 0.4 molar, molar, molar solution or 0.8 or 1.0 molar solution. And a mo um, when you say it's a molar solution, what that means is moles per liter, okay? Moles per liter. And you know the six solutions I gave you, moles per liter, yes? You all right? Okay, the next thing, R, this is another constant, okay? And this is, you don't have to memorize it, okay? But it's 0 0.0831 liters bars, okay? Moles Kelvin. Okay. or better written 0 0.0831 liters bar moles Kelvin. Okay, you, That is just a constant in this, just like gravitational constants, you know, this is just a constant. Okay, 
Next is T. What is T? Temperature. In this case, temperature is measured in Kelvin. If you want to know what Kelvin is, Kelvin is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273. That's what it is right there. Okay, are we all right so far? Okay, now, if I know, I always am gonna use a negative right here. That's not gonna change. If it's just like glucose, this is always gonna be one. <laughs> this is whatever molar solution I have. This is a constant, doesn't change. And then this is temperature that I have to figure out. Now, let's see if we can cancel out any units to see what water potential is actually measured in. Do you see any units I could cross cancel here or cancel? Yes. The liters, the liters. exactly. Liters, liters, gone. What else? What else? Moles. Moles, gone. What else? Kelvin. Kelvin, gone. So water potential is always given as a value, and then it's bars. That's how it's measured, in bars. Follow so far? OK, now whose turn is it, young or old? OK, young one. Here is how it looks on your equation sheet. I literally took a picture of it. It's verbatim how it looks on your equation that you need to know. I would like you to talk through this top to bottom. Go ahead. I'm going to pause you for a second. Okay, come back to me. Let's see if we understand it by using this, okay? So I recommend you try to do this on your own, and when you come up with your answer, do a little double tap. If you want to get out a piece of paper and a pen and that works best for you, please do so. If you want to use your Chromebook and a note and your stylus, you can throw it in your notes. Do what works for you. You be you. Okay? I am going to pose a question um, for you to, to, to solve. Okay? And I'm not going to write it in a complete sentence. What is the water potential of a point? Three a molar solution at 21 degrees Celsius. Okay. What is the water potential of a 0.38 molar solution at 21 degrees Celsius? Now, for those of you at home whom we are missing today, I recommend that you pause the video and solve it and then turn the video back on. All right, you're super smart. I'm already proud of you. You're getting better, as in well. Start um, solving it, just so you can see how, what I would do if I was doing this on a test, the first thing I would do is I would, the first thing I would do is write the equation. Now, the way they'll phrase it to you, too, is they'll say, in an open container. And when they say, in an open container, that means that the pressure potential is equal to what? Zero. Zero. Okay. So now, you're just this. We okay so far? Okay. Then, I would say negative one. That's your ionization constant. What's your molarity? 0.38 moles per liter. Okay, then um, R. Yeah, perfect. So we're liter, bars, moles, Kelvin. And then temperature, I would have to go 21 plus 273. 294, is that what you got? Okay, so I go 294, oh, kaka, 294 Kelvin, right? And all your units would cancel out. I get moles and moles and liter and liter and Kelvin and Kelvin, so I'm just down to bars. And when you did that, what did you get? Negative, that's key, negative. See if your answer has a negative on it. Then what did you have? Nine point what? Bars. And that would be your answer. Okay? If I already give you bars, don't type bars in for an answer. If it already gives you bars, you know, like on an answer sheet or something like that. Okay? Ask your bio buddy. Any questions about that?
Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you now, to, or is there anything you want to ask me about that? Okay, so I did negative, I did one, because it's sugar, no ionization. I plugged in the molarity. Remember M, okay, I'm just making, that's, I needed to show you how the units would cancel out. M just means moles per liter. When you say molarity, you're referring as moles per liter. Okay, and then this is a given that never changes, so that's the same number every time. And then this. Be careful on your temperature that you don't just put just 273 or you forget to include that and add it. Now, we didn't take the temperature on our potatoes, right? No. We need to come back. Um, we're going to say room temperature was about 22 degrees Celsius is what we're going to go with. Okay? All right? Because that's usually what it is. Now, um, hello, smart. Okay, and I want you to walk out that door. Pause this again for a second. No, it's okay. Walk out that door, and then I want you to log in today as your favorite holiday. But first, walk out that door. Your cereal, you're your person. So quickly get out that door so I can clear it, okay? So it's calculate to the tenths the water potential of a 0.6 molar sucrose solution with, with a room temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. Oh, don't look. Okay, and your second question after you calculate that is what would happen to a chunk of carrot with a water potential of minus 2.7 2 bars put into the solution from the first question? So what would happen to a chunk of carrot with a water potential of negative 2.7 bars if it was put into the solution that I just had you calculate the water potential for? Hashtag you got this. Okay, here we go. Let's see how you did. Okay. Now, why is this person wrong? They didn't round to the tenth. Why is this person wrong? They put bars and bars is already there. You gotta pay attention. Why is this person wrong? They're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, they put a space or something. These guys are all right. Yeah, there's a space between the negative and the one. Yeah, so I didn't, and then why is this person wrong? For various reasons, <laughs> okay? So if we, if we work this out, if I were to calculate this out, I would write it as solute potential equals negative ICRT, which is negative 1.6 molar, because I know what that is, 0.08, 31 liters bar mole Kelvin times 22 plus 273-592-295, and then you would get minus 14.7. Check with your bio buddy first. Was that an easy call, a hard call, confusion? Go ahead. That was an easy <laughs> All right. Questions on the math. Look, look to me, you guys. We have a lot to do. Questions on the math? No. No? Okay. So now let's take it to the next question. Next question. Oh, suck a doodle dandy. Okay. What would happen? That sounded bad. I didn't mean it to. What would happen to a chunk of carrot? So let's get a beaker. And we've got some solution in that beaker. What is the water potential of that beaker? And now I'm going to go get a chunk of carrot. Okay. And what is the molarity a la chunk of carrot? Negative 2.7. Who has a greater water potential? The carrot. 
Remember, what's the best of all best water potential? Zero. Zero. That is purely hypotonic, and that's probably something you want to remember. Okay? Hypotonic. Okay? Zero water potential. Okay? And so negative 2.7 is closer to zero if you're on a number line than negative 14.7, yeah? So this carrot has greater water potential, which means it's more hypotonic. Water must flow from the hypo. The carrot would shrink. Okay, shrink and shrivel. Check with your bio buddy. Hard call, easy call, confused. Do you understand it now? It took me a second to like remember like what everything is. Okay. Like oh, number line works. Number line works. Okay. All right. Now, let's move on with our content that we needed to talk about because I believe in our notes we left off, you told me, at 5.3? Okay, so let's start with using a protein, okay? If you are moving in the direction indicated in this diagram, do you think that that is passive or active? Taking this diagram at its word, passive or active? Passive. passive. Why? Right. Because yeah, it's going from a higher concentration to a lower, lower concentration. concentration. However, whatever this thing is, is not going through the phospholipid bilayer. It must be large or charged. Where are you? Okay. So instead it has to use a protein, but it's going with the protein gradient. It is still diffusing but it needs a way to get from one side to the other. What kind of diffusion do we call that? Facilitated. facilitated diffusion. The protein is just facilitating the passage. However, if this arrow was going this way, we would have to call it what kind of transport? Active because we're going against the concentration gradient. We're rolling the ball uphill. That's gonna cost us some energy. Okay, look at your bio buddy, nod if you understand, tell your bio buddy if you have questions. All right, so here, just, this is facilitated transport. Youngest bio buddy, tell them why. These are spaceships. Oh, yeah. going from one side of the membrane to the other. Are they going with or against the concentration gradient? Wait, they're going from high to low. It's just getting facilitated by that protein. All right? Now, let's keep going. Look right here. Active transport. Look at the arrows. Look at the arrows. Oldest bio buddy, I believe it's your turn. Explain why is this active transport other than the obvious it says ATP on it, and I labeled it active transport. Okay, go. <laughs> Okay, so are we still using a protein? Yes. Would we have to use a protein for this? Yes. Because you can't make it go against its concentration gradient when you have a phospholipid bilayer because there's nothing to facilitate that, right? But we are using energy here and we're concentrating it um, up above, yeah? We're taking it from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. Still okay? All right. Now, the most famous one of all is the sodium potassium pump, right? Or NAK ATPase, okay? Because it requires energy. Oh, sorry, that's in your notes. Let's go to your notes. You're like, what are you saying? Okay, go to your notes. 5.3, active transport across a membrane, energy is required. 
Um, did I give you facilitated right above that? Okay, good. Molecules moved against their concentration gradient. Did I give it to you? No. Oh, okay. She misspoke. Let's back up just a little bit. Do we have the chart all filled in for solution around a cell? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Facilitated transport is uses a carrier, uses a carrier protein that is specific for the substance being transported. Using a carrier protein that is specific for the substance being transported. The protein may undergo a conformational change during the transport. Okay, and we already learned, back when we learned all of this, if that protein shape isn't right, is it going to be able to do its job to no, facilitate? No. no. Okay. Molec and active transport, molecules moved against their concentration gradient, and it requires carrier proteins and ATP. These proteins are called pumps, because they're pumping something from one side to the other side using energy. An example is the NAK ATPase, or the common name sodium potassium pump. I just don't want you to freak out if they happen to write it that other way, so I want you to learn that way too. The same protein that pumps three sodium molecules to the outside of the cell pumps two potassium ions to the inside, and it uses ATP. How much ATP of our body does it use? 30%. 30%. Okay. This sets up an electrochemical gradient, electrochemical gradient, because there's a difference on either side of the membrane, um, and the membranes become polarized. Like if you've heard polar opposites, right? There's a difference. So the outside of the membrane becomes positively charged, the inside must become negative. negatively, right? Um, that all neurons and nerve cells require to function. B, NaCl transport is important to many cells. Sodium is actively transported and chloride ions will passively follow. So you just have to worry about pumping the sodium because chloride is gonna follow because it's what? Uh, attracted to the positive sodium ions, right? Ions attract, ionic bonds, yeah? So if you just pump the sodium, chloride will be like, okay, I'm going to. And they can just, you know, follow along, you know, through a chloride ion channel. All right, this leads us to bulk transport. Okay, bulk transport, here we go. Indo and, sorry, this is still messed up. Indo and exocytosis. Indo sounds just like it looks. Indo, the cell. Endocytosis. Is that going to cost you ATP? Yes, of course it is. You're moving the cytoskeleton around in order to engulf something, right? And then exocytosis, it's going out. Always follow the arrows to make sure you have the right one. Endocytosis, there are three different types of endocytosis. See if you could just guess looking at me. Cell, drinking, drinking cell, eating. And then the last one is receptor-mediated endocytosis. So we'll go over those. So here is phagocytosis, that is cell eating. That could be like a white blood cell eating a bacterium, or it could be an amoeba eating a paramecium. That is phagocytosis. Penocytosis, cell drinking, you're drinking a solution. It might be a sugary solution, but you're engulfing it and drinking it. That could happen across a capillary um, wall. That's called endothelium, and it could drink those fluids. Um, receptor mediated is one of my favorite. So receptor, proteins can be receptors, right? So just imagine a whole bunch of receptors that bind the cell membrane, and what happens is that molecule binds, and then once all the receptors are full, hmm, okay? And it brings it in, and now it's got it in a little vesicle. Here's an example of that. These are called coated pits. So once everything binds, then it'll do that endocytosis. All right, so let's put this in our notes. Exocytosis, a vesicle formed by the Golgi apparatus, fuses with the plasma membrane to secrete substances such as hormones, neurotransmitters, and enzymes. Endocytosis, phagoty phagocytosis is cellular eating, large molecules engulfed. Penocytosis is cellular drinking, vesicles formed around fluids. 
And receptor-mediated endocytosis is a form of chemocytosis. Specific macromolecules binds to the receptors. It is selective and more efficient than penocytosis. And used to move substances from maternal to fetal blood. All right, let's give it a go. See how well you understand it. I'm just going to click through the questions so you can see them. I'm going to answer them at your own pace. Here's number one. You can pause it if you want to. Number two. Here is number three. Guys, we don't answer out loud because we need to give everybody an opportunity. Right? Okay, here's number three. And here is number four. So just pause if you need to. And the next time you see me, I'll be going over the answers. Or hear me. Okay, here we go. It always surprises me when people miss it, but people always do. How did you know not to choose endocytosis? Follow the arrows. Okay? You could never have heard this lecture. Just use your large mammalian brain. Okay? And so it looks like things are inside and now things are outside. So that's going to be exocytosis. Check with your bio buddy. Easy call, hard call, struggle. Yay, good job. Any questions on two? Ye oh. Pumps used in active transport are made of proteins, not cholesterol. What's the role of cholesterol in cell membranes? Fluidity of the membrane, so it doesn't get too hot or cold. Well, it can't determine hot or cold, so think of something else. It doesn't freeze, it doesn't fall apart. Okay, good. It can't determine the temperature. Ah! Pickles, what was a pickle before it was a pickle? And it got smaller. Water must flow from the hypotonic, flew out of the cucumber and into the solution around it, so it had to be hypertonic. All right, now, the next part is mini-me, but I want you to have an understanding of it, right? In your notes, it's smaller, okay? We said the four things that make up a cell membrane are what? Phospholipids. Proteins. Carbohydrates, what's called the glycocalyx, and cholesterol. The carbohydrates, there are two types. What are the two types? Glycolipids and glycoproteins. Good job. Glycolipids and glycoproteins could be part of a larger kind of mesh around that cell called the? ECM. Yeah, ECM. Sorry, I was thinking. And that stands for extracellular matrix, okay? Now, this is important because we, as animals, do not have any cell walls. Walls that can be cemented together with pectin to hold a plant rigid and firm. But why is it that you can grab your, your arm right now and not rip your skin off? I mean, you could, you could if you applied enough force. You could just rip your skin right off, okay? But we're not going to do that. But why is my skin stain attached? Junctions. Good. So I want to quickly review the three junctions so you understand them. The first one is called a tight junction. Remember we said channels, carriers, then what? Junction. Oh, okay. Cell recognition, receptor, receptor enzymatic, enzymatic junction. junction. Here we go. Okay. Tight junction is like, can you make a, oh, sorry. Can you make a fist? <laughs> <laughs> he has a cast on, so it doesn't work. Okay. So, so it's like my protein is directly connected to his protein. Where one end stops, you can't tell. That's good. That's a good seal right there. Think about it. If you had a bladder, you have a bladder. Um, but when you say leaky bladder, that would be like, you piss. But, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I'm tired. I haven't had anything to eat today. But when, what I want you to think about. <laughs> it's terrible. Other people listen to these, not just to be <laughs> I'm going to be better. Bladder, I don't want the contents of my bladder to leak into my abdomen, right? That's bad, okay? So we want to have real tight junctions between those cells. All right, let's move on. Gap <laughs> junction. If you could do this one, go like this. Ah, okay? So he is a protein, I'm a protein, I'm a cell, he's a cell. 
fluids can go back and forth between these two in order to facilitate maybe the passage of a substance. Like when your heart beats, you want it to beat like all the time, all together at the same time, ready, go beat. So um, that's one way to facilitate that, okay? So substances can move back and forth. And then what you have where, oh, there we go. Adhesion junctions, it's like part of my, if this is where my sleeve is, put your sleeve up. Where my, our sleeves are is one cell, okay? And then our cytoskeletons are joined. My arm still continues into the cell and his arm still continues, but our cytoskeletons are all connected. Okay, that's what an adhesion junction is, and it can allow kind of a stretchiness for when you need that. And there are pictures of them. Da, 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 da. Notice on here, there's a plaque that kind of it gets lodged in. Otherwise, it might like pull through all the way to the other side. Does that make sense? So it's cemented in there. Um, here you go with some tight junctions. And then here's a gap junction. And you have those in your notes as mini me's because I think it's helpful to understand, okay? Though they may not specifically ask you what is a gap junction. All right, um, now we're to the extracellular matrix, okay? Just looks like a bunch of stuff. There's this fibronectin, there's collagen in there. Sometimes people get collagen, like to make the wrinkles go away. Elastin, my elastin's breaking down. Why? Because I'm getting old. I don't look terrible, okay? <laughs> and so it's, it's, that's what makes the wrinkles, is all that elastin breaking down and laminin. So your extracellular matrix has a lot of different functions, resilience, signaling, communication, and strength, okay? And the glycocalyx is a part of that. All right, now back to the plants. And I'm gonna bring this up now because it's a thinking question um, that you could get asked, especially when we start talking about plants. When you have a plant, here's my cell, what's the first thing to the interior I would have? Cell membrane. And then to the outside of that would be a cell wall made out of what? Cellulose. Then joining one wall to another wall could be this pectin, okay? That connects like the cement between the different walls to hold everything together. Now a primary wall is what's laid down initially, but plants will have a secondary wall or a secondarily thickened wall. Depending on how thick it is, is how hard that wood is. Like pine, you could probably scratch your name into, but cherry wood is very hard, so it depends on the secondarily thickened walls. But tell me this, where would that secondary wall go? Where do you think it would go? Tell your bio buddy. Where would that secondarily thickened wall go? Would it be outside the pectin? Would it be between the pectin and the primary wall or between the primary wall and the cell membrane? What do you think? It has to be between, any guesses? Primary wall and what? Cell membrane. Who's going to make it? The cell's going to make it, right? So you make a primary wall. If you want to make a secondarily thickened wall, it has to come from inside the cell, right? It can't go, whoa, you know, like throw wall stuff over the other. Let's get over there, okay? Now, when I, once I explain it to you, you're like, mm -hmm. okay? But those are the kinds of questions you get where you have to apply your logic, your large mammalian brain, because some of you will like go, well, it's one, two, because we count, one, two, three, four. <laughs> so cell membrane, primal, second row. No, okay, the secondary wall has to be put to the interior, and I just want you to remember that, okay? That is the end of that. We now need to transition into our lab. So um, let's talk about that and talk about lab data. Can you pull your lab data up as well? This is your lab data, right? Your lab data. We'll talk about that. Okay, so now, very quickly, let's go through and apply what we have learned, okay? This first part, we already did. We already analyzed that. I already asked you to make your um, conclusions on that. Your dialysis tubing. You put various molarities of solutions inside your dialysis tubing, and then you set those tubings in water. You agree? Okay. So then what you had to do is you had to take 
the initial mass, the final mass, and calculate the percent change. Final minus initial over initial. How much did it change? All right. And then if we look at your data for that, oh, boom. If we look at your data for that, you can see a trend. Yes? Are you seeing a trend here? Do you understand why some of them are outlier data? Can you check with your bio buddy? Go over a couple of them that I've made outliers. Do you see any others that should have been outliers? Are you good with that? Is that way off? Way off. Okay, yeah, you're out. All right, now taking a look at this, okay, what is the trend that we see? As I increase the molarity of the solution inside of the dialysis tubing that I placed into a beaker of distilled water, I also had an increase in the percent change of the mass that was proportional. Does that sound like a good claim? Okay, because that's what I'm seeing. The evidence, my data table, you could list some numbers, that's your evidence. One sentence, just list the evidence, okay? Um, my reason, you would just need to talk about diffusion and osmosis, right? What are the principles of diffusion? What is diffusion? What is osmosis? And explain that. It doesn't need to be 10, 20 sentences. You can do it in three, right? As long as you're convincing me of that. Air. Is there room for air in here? Apparently. <laughs> okay? So it could be that you didn't allow the bag to expand and it wanted to come in and it couldn't. It could be that you didn't cut your string. Um, could be that you didn't get the string wet. It could be that you had poor massing skills. It could be that you mixed up the solutions. At least one of them was like, oh, okay, 20 and 23.5. Wow, big difference. And there were some other ones in there where I was like, very surprising what your results were. Okay, so that could be a good error for that. All right, so that's that part. So you just, all you need to do is do the math on the percent change and then claim evidence reason error. Okay, the next part is moving on to our potatoes. Is it oldest bio buddy's turn? Yes. Yeah. Oldest bio buddy? You should be able to explain this, no problem. Okay, beginning of an observation, after observation, this is just a review, but you should be able to do this. Go ahead. So I don't know where you got cut off. I apologize if you missed some explanations. I just noticed that you were disconnected. Hopefully, you've got everything. All right, other bio buddy here. This is not a regular potato. Let's say it's a sweet potato. And I'm not putting it in distilled water. Okay, now keep going. Okay, this part was easy peasy, right? Do you need me to go over anything? I don't mean to say it's easy peasy. Do you, is there any confusion here? Anything you need me to talk about? Okay, so on here, is this pure distilled water? No. no, it's got stuff in it. They're drawing little flakes in there. Plus, you know, it says solute potential is minus 12. There's no pressure because it's an open container, zero. So overall, the potential of this solution, regardless if I had a piece of potato in there or not, in and of itself, its water potential is minus 12. Okay? Because it's a factor of two things. Pressure potential, of which there is none because it's an open container. Nobody's pushing on it. Nobody's in a vacuum. And I sprinkled some salt or sugar in there, so now it's minus 12. 
okay? As opposed to this potato, okay? This potato, let's say it's been sitting in here for a while, okay, this sweet potato, it had a lot of sugars in it, it's minus 15, that's how it came. Lots of sugars in it, it's a sweet potato. And as it's been sitting in there, water's been moving in. At first, maybe the pressure potential was only <laughs> two, so this would be minus 13, right? But as more and more water came in, the wall's pushing back more and more, but it's like, I'm so sugary. And it's pushing back until it stops. There's no net change when the water potential is the same on either side of the membrane, yes? yes. Is this potato an isotonic solution right now? No, it is not. It's just the wall is pushing back in order to make it not have any net change, okay? Do I need to add more or less stuff to this solution to get it to be isotonic so there's no net change? More stuff, right? So that it would be isotonic and then the wall wouldn't even have to do any business, yes? Okay, and that's what we were trying to find in our potato lab, okay? You cord your potatoes, okay, and you put them in different molarities of solutions, yes, in your little containers. I can skip that, skip that, skip that. They're sitting in their little containers and you started recording the percent change. Are we okay? Okay, now have your data out. If we look at that, looking at the potato data, okay. All right, now, um, some of you took your red away. So this had um, each of the different groups. Why can't I scroll? I'm going to come over here. Okay, so these had your different groups. Yeah, they took their red away because they hadn't done their math. Um, here, okay. And then if we go and you had to put it onto here, okay. These teams, seven and eight, you didn't put your data on here. Group one, you didn't put your data on here. That's why you're red, and that's why I was angry, okay? And somebody is up in my box, and so it's messing it up. So I'd like you to get out, okay? So um, you forgot to put it onto the third one, okay? So now, let's take a look at this. At first, the potatoes in zero gained weight, yes? <coughs> and in point two, what did they do? Did they lose weight? Well, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Point two, they, still they still gained weight, right? And once you got to point four, what did they do? They lost, lost weight. weight. So an isotonic solution where it didn't gain or lose would be somewhere between what? Between a point two molar and a? Because somewhere in there was a demarcation zone, right? because I gained weight at point two, but I lost weight at point four. So somewhere in there is the isotonic solution. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay, and then I still lost weight, I still lost weight, I still lost weight. Why are these about the same? Why didn't they start changing anymore? Because they what? They probably couldn't, right? They probably lost all the water they could lose. It didn't matter if I, you know, put them in a four molar solution, they weren't gonna lose any more water. Is that, are you there? So that's what we needed to see. So we could graph our results. So let's go back here, okay? You would set up a graph where you would have zero water loss and then, or zero mass change. And then here we have gain weight and this would be losing weight. And then you could put molarities across the bottom, sucrose molarities across the bottom, percent change in mass on the side, and the molarities would go from zero all the way to what? 1.0, okay? So maybe you set it up like this. Now, mine are not completely lining up for various reasons, um, but we'll just do our best, okay? Are you all right with me? Now, you tell me the data, and I'll show you how I would plot it. So what was the first, um, what was the zero? What was our class shared data for that one? Go up here. Okay, what was it? Tell me one more time. 22. Okay, so I would go, here's at zero, this is 10, this is 20, these go up by two, so 20, 22. Okay, what was the point two molar? 5.9, so here is zero. 
two, four, right about here. Okay? Give me the next one. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. What? Okay, so here is 10, and then these go by twos. So that's 12, so maybe there. Tell me if I put it in the wrong spot. It's just because I'm not thinking. And what's point six? 26. Okay, so this is 20, 2, 4, 6, maybe right there. Okay, next one. Okay, so this is 20, 2, 4, 6. That's 8, so I'll just back it up a little bit. Okay, and the last one. Okay, so this is the 30 line, though it doesn't look like it. 31.5? Yes. Okay, now I'm going to just plot those dots. I'm not connecting the dots. I just plot the dots on there, make them so they're easy, easy to see. And then the next thing I need to have is I need to get a ruler. I need my ruler to be a little bit bigger. And I'm going to try to make my best made line where I go through most of the dots. Now, I'm going to start to eliminate these dots. And why would I be justified in doing that? What? Yeah, it can't lose anymore, right? So I'm kind of taking them into consideration, but not so much. And then I just make a line, best made line using my ruler. I'm not amazing. If you have a ruler out, it'll let you make a line along the ruler, okay? So even if I went, nah, it would probably still do it, okay? So this is my best fit right here to go between all these dots. So now, what's the key thing that I want to find out? Where it what? Where it's at zero, because at zero is the right molarity where water's not coming in or water's not going out. And at that point, the pressure is, what's the pressure? Zero. So let's, oops, be straight. Okay, so now let's go right here. And this is exactly what you need to do as well, is where it crosses zero, you need to use a ruler and make a straight line and go down. Okay, and now we said it was going to be somewhere between point two and what? Point four. Okay, good job, Winnie. So now all I need to do is look to see where this is. So this is point two right here, two, four, six, eight, three. I'm right here, so it is at point, point, three, two molar. Now that's equal to my C in that equation, 0.0831. Let's say we're at 22 degrees Celsius. You can be able to figure out what the water potential of your potatoes was. Now, do you see if I would have given you carrots, it might have been different, right? Yeah. If I would have given you celery, it might have been different. So the way it would look, okay, is you're just plugging in your molarity. You have your minus your one, you have this, and then 22 degrees would be 295. So you're gonna make a claim. The water potential of the potatoes is blah. It needs to match your graphing. That's what I'll look at everybody's graph to see that they put in the right molarity for what their graph shows, okay? So my claim is the water potential for our potatoes was blah. My evidence is here's the water potential calculation. Um, claim evidence reason. The reason you're going to talk about the pressure potential was zero. So as long as I could calculate the solute potential, I had the water potential. And then you can address any errors you think you might have. And then you're good. All right. Now, um, I think that was, oh, here. I put it in a lab book, though I regret how I drew this one because it went to this, in this particular, the potatoes I used, I don't remember what I used, uh, the first time I drew this, see how it goes to 40%? So we don't have that, right? And I don't think, I have mine changing every five. That's really too big of a change to plot accurately. You know, so the other one I had them doing by twos. So what you're gonna need to have is your graph on half of a page and then your calculations below it. Because I need to look at your calculations and look at your graph to see that they reflect that. 
with your zero line drawn hard and then your line going down the, the to the to the molarity. Does that make sense from that zero line where it crosses? So be thoughtful because I've had people just kind of meh on their graph and then they just use the same calculations as everybody in the lab team. And I'm like, eh, your graph doesn't really say that, okay? And then you don't get any points for your graph or your calculations, okay? So just make sure you're cautious in that. All right, so we had a little bit of catching up to do, so you don't have a lot of time to work on your lab, but I think you're gonna do a better job on your quiz now. So class is out in 14 minutes, so why don't I give you like two minutes to get your head together? Um, but while you're getting your head together, why don't you go into Hello Smart so you can walk out that door, so we're good for that too. And I hope that was helpful for you. You're super smart. Be better.